welcome back to Energy 101. In this video, we have another special guest for you. I'm joined by the Executive Director of the Rever Center for Energy, Sustainability, and Innovation, April Salas, and she's here to talk to us about energy finance. Welcome, April. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yes, can you tell us a little about um, who you are and what you do at Dartmouth? Yeah, absolutely. My name is April Salas. I'm the Executive Director of the Rever Center for Energy, Sustainability, and Innovation. We're one of six research centers at Tuck, uh, supporting uh, pathways of learning and application for MBA students. And um, at our center, we are focused around energy, sustainability, uh, climate change, and working uh, at Tuck, uh, at Dartmouth, and beyond. Um, our mission is to inspire and shape tomorrow's leaders in energy while engaging our energy community today. And, and we really believe fundamentally that regardless of you know, the industry, tomorrow's wise leaders are going to need to make informed energy, climate, sustainability decisions during their careers that drive uh, innovation uh, for a sustainable future. Great. Thank you so much. We are really, really happy to have you here. So, so thank you again for being with us. Um, all right. So I'm, yeah, thank you. I'm going to start out with a really basic question, um, which is going to be good for me too, because I don't know anything about finance. Can you tell us um, what we actually mean when we say energy finance? So I think it's a really fantastic question, and I think it's often misunderstood. It's kind of like the word sustainability. You know, a lot of people understand it. We use it a lot, um, but don't quite understand what it means. And at the heart of it, energy finance is really thinking about access to money, access to capital, and uh, corporations have certain... Um, I think, uh, you know, sort of needs and, uh, and criteria that need to be met in order to finance, to provide capital to entities. And then we as individuals may need access um, to borrow money in order to pay for something that, that we intend to do. And in the, in the world of energy, um, it's a capital intensive energy uh, industry, uh, meaning that um, it's typically like hard infrastructure that needs to be built and um, we need to finance it in some way. And so finance really involves uh, credit worthiness of the borrower. It involves um, the credit worthiness of the construction entity. Um, and then you have uh, on the lending side entities who may uh, lend to uh, one of those or more of the entities um, at a sort of risk premium. So how much are they willing to, to sort of lend you the money for? What's the cost of doing that business um, for them? And so, you know, energy finance, um, it, it's, uh, it feels like a catch-all term, but again, a lot of that can, can, can really rely on uh, market conditions, the nature of the energy project, how risky the technology is. Um, and I think that's where, you know, as we get into the conversation, we talk about, you know, some of the more traditional energy projects that are in sort of strong markets that have been around for a long time versus new technologies in less proven markets. It really sort of changes the dynamics of the financing. Great, thank you. That was a really great introduction to the con to, to the topic. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, all right. So my next question is, can you tell us a little bit about what the role of energy finance is um, in possibly accelerating our transitions to um, cleaner energy systems? Absolutely. And I think it's it's going to be one of the most critical aspects that we're facing. I think the UN really focused on it at this year's COP in Glasgow. It's like there's a trillion plus uh, in investments that are required in order for us to transition our energy systems. In many countries, like in the United States, our infrastructure was built and is sort of being maintained, but over the course of the last 100 to 125, 150 years. And it was built in a way where the government really supported that growth and development. And then at some point transitioned to the private sector or the private sector stepped in and develop uh, aspects of our energy system. And so as we think about transitioning our energy system to lower carbon technologies, it's kind of back to what I just mentioned, you know, is it a proven technology? If I invest in this new company with this new technology, will it exist in five years? Will I get my, be able to um, not only capture investment that I made, but will I be able to get my money back? Um, so when we think about financing the clean energy transition, um, there's a lot of factors to consider. Um, much of which I just mentioned, there are some really interesting instruments that entities are using like tax equity, equity that I won't get into. It's a little bit more complicated, um, but it will be critical to access, you know, upwards of a trillion plus dollars if we are to sort of transition our uh, economy globally um, towards cleaner, uh, lower uh, carbon emitting uh, resources. But I think what we need is really proven instances. Um, and I think 
the industry is really anchored around how to restructure um, business models in a way that can access uh, financing that's required um, to build these projects, but also um, to sustain a, um, a demand, a demand for that. And, um, and one of the most important things I think we're going to get into as well is around how to do that in a fair and equitable way. Because the way that the business model is structured right now, if we just look at the power sector, if you think about it as a bathtub, um, you know, the utilities are sort of the suppliers of, of default power. So they're the provider of, of last resort if there's no other access to power. Well, they have to go before a public utilities commission or some other type of body to say, here's what we plan to spend and here's how much we plan to charge. And we have, let's say, 100 customers. Then the utility, the public utilities commission will say, great, you are approved. And so as we think about the transition in some of our communities where maybe you see your neighbor putting on solar or you see large scale solar arrays or other things that are maybe decreasing the amount of customers that are in that pool. And so now maybe you have 80 customers. That becomes a little bit tricky because the costs are the same, but now they're divided by 80 people instead of 100 people. So the folks who are remaining in the bathtub are now paying a little bit more. So it's really important to find alternative um, ways to transition um, our energy economy in a way that uh, also facilitates sort of equal access to those clean technologies and doesn't cost shift the burden onto the folks who can't necessarily afford to make those choices um, to switch. Great. Thank you so much for that. And, and yes, that is a fantastic transition into the next question that I was going to ask, because you you explained a little bit about the problem of, of inequities within the system. Um, but are there are there any actual energy finance mechanisms that we can use to kind of help undo that? Yeah, it's a really good point. And I think um, it's it's sort of a, a question that's in evolution. You know, there are um, green banks that are evolving and we're seeing some in the US. We're also, uh, I think, looking at uh, other ways of generating funds that help fund the, these programs, um, either through philanthropic means, social impact investors. So investors who aren't necessarily fixed on how much return they're gonna get on that money invested and they're willing to uh, accept longer investment return uh, planning horizon. So instead of maybe six years, maybe 15 years um, or in perpetuity. And so that's really important, I think, in supporting this transition because we are gonna have to come up with not only um, innovative financing solutions, but I think maybe continue to support um, the good thinking and evolution and how the business model is structured uh, for those incumbent uh, companies. So maybe we aren't necessarily dividing anymore by the total number of people in the bathtub, but we can think a little bit more creatively um, about incentivizing payments uh, for things like de decarbonization um, or performance of, of certain buildings or other characteristics as opposed to you know, how much uh, it costs or reduce in costs. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I just have one more question here, but we have we have a little bit of time. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's anything that we, we haven't asked that, that you think I, maybe I should ask you. Um, should there be a question in here about the role of energy markets or, um, or something like that? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, you know, I think one of the important um, sort of aspects that we are really looking at and, uh, and supporting our students in is, is actually um, not necessarily driven from the bottom up, but it's actually driven from the top down. And it's what's happening in the financial markets and in the lending. Um, where they are now saying we're requiring companies to be more um, environmentally conscious, or we're not willing to lend money, um, or uh, maybe it'll have a higher uh, sort of cost attributed with the lending of that money. And so that's actually a really interesting innovation is we're seeing the banks say, you must as a company or an entity, you know, uh, desiring to finance a particular project, be more socially and environmentally conscious. And that's, I think, a really uh, important innovation for us to watch. So seeing Wall Street sort of dictate that, while it may not be, um, you know, sort of driven from them in, in, intentionally, it, it sort of is where it is. And, and we should take advantage of, I think, um, the value that it brings, you know, is, is the folks who the institutional investors, um, pension funds. So, so almost the entire financing supply chain is now saying, well, we're going to require you to report out on your 
uh, environmental stewardship. And therefore, we're going to require as a condition of lending that you report on your environmental stewardship. And that sort of trickling effect is, is sort of also creating the momentum that we need to encourage companies um, and the overall development of, of our uh, energy and climate transition to be more environmentally conscious. And I think that's something that you didn't ask about, but it's, it's certainly something that students should be aware of because we're seeing companies like Patagonia have a more sustainable and, and socially conscious mission. Um, we're seeing companies like maybe Nike or, right, like there are these companies that we, we don't think of as energy companies now doing things that are um, much more in the space of, uh, of energy uh, project development. They're actually developing their own solar arrays. They're developing and spurring and requiring, right, like that the utilities that they buy power from provide cleaner energy and more choices. All of this is putting pressure on, um, on the transition in a really positive way. And it's creating a pool of money, like companies who are willing to pay for these things, entities who are willing to pay for these projects, um, that's actually helping to spur the innovation. So it's actually really important that we're getting the request from everyday people like you and me and the students in the room, but also from the financial and the lending institutions and then the companies are getting it um, you know, in, in their ways as well. And all of that, I think, contributes um, to the transition as a whole. And, and that's kind of the approach we need. And sort of the last aspect of that is, is really looking at um, transitioning the business models. How do we think about business model innovation so that we can factor in the cost of not doing that um, which yet again, I think now we're seeing more and more in, in the boardroom, um, and, uh, and being considered in the boardroom. So that's really important as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, April. Um, that was really fascinating. Um, so I have one final question here for you, um, which is because I think energy finance is sort of something that a lot of people are not that familiar with. Um, is, is energy finance a, a strong career option? Is this something that people can, can go off and consider as a, a career? And if so, um, how, how would students kind of prepare for that? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the bottom line is absolutely. Um, we're seeing, uh, you know, as, as you can imagine, MBAs are um, traditionally going into careers in consulting and, and investment banking. But um, we are increasingly, and, and yes, they still do. The roles, though, I think that we're seeing around energy finance are much broader. Yes, the traditional roles are in investment banking, in private equity, um, even in the venture, so earlier stage company companies, uh, the venture capital space. Um, but the sort of, we call it climate tech, uh, the climate um, technology sort of uh, um, ecosystem has just exploded. And then I mentioned those companies like Nike and, and, and Patagonia and others who are just environment, more environmentally conscious or transitioning. So these are companies that are very old and are now thinking about internal innovation. So students have opportunities all along the spectrum. And then you have startups like you know, Rivian or a, a Tesla. It's hard to think of Tesla as a startup anymore, but, but it is. It's an earlier stage company um, at some point. And our students are going in careers um, focused on finance in those companies. Um, and they're helping to spur, um, I think, a lot of the good work that links the finance world with the actual project development or the product delivery of these companies. So I'd say if students are interested in the intersection of these two, you're in a really good starting point. There's so much um, opportunity right now. Um, some of the really good skills you can start practicing on are really, you know, just financial fluency, Excel. Um, modeling skills, and then really maybe understanding the industry. It's not necessarily a prerequisite for finance, but it certainly helps when you have some understanding of how finance actually helps lead towards the business decisions. Because the way that it, it really kind of gets down to the heart of me, think about maybe a solar developer, you know, if I'm financing this project, um, at what point do, am I looking through the lens of finance uh, for when we're able to proceed with this project or we need to maybe change something, some configuration of, of the project in order to make it um, possible for us to move forward. So finance plays a critical role in most companies and, um, and there are so many companies right now that are looking for, for students that have these skill sets. So um, happy to talk more about that if there are more specific questions, but it's certainly a really good time to be getting into the uh, energy industry as a whole, anything dealing with climate uh, finance or climate tech, and thinking broadly. Um, almost every company that we work with has some aspect that's touching on one of the topics I just mentioned. So don't think about just your traditional companies anymore. It's really everywhere from early stage companies to large multinationals to 
to the traditional finance and banking community. Um, and the needs are, are plentiful at all levels. So hopefully that helps. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Well, well, that is it. Unless there's anything else that you have to add. Um, April, thank you so much for, for being with us. And we really appreciate you coming to Energy 101 and, and sharing all of this about energy finance with us. Absolutely. All right, thank you again so much to April for joining us in our next and final video for Energy 101. We're joined again by Professor Elizabeth Wilson, who is going to talk to us this time about energy policy. We'll see you there.